Representatives from 40 countries and international organisations have discussed the reconstruction of Ukraine, not after, but while the fighting still rages. But isn't this a little premature? And will the principles they agree on have any lasting impact? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Sahil Rahman. More than four months of war has destroyed countless cities and towns in Ukraine. Its allies, though, want to start rebuilding as soon as possible. More than 40 nations and international organisations have outlined priorities for the reconstruction of Ukraine. They met 2,000 kilometres west of Kyiv in the Swiss city of Lugano, where they agreed on the Lugano Principles. The guidelines include strengthening the rule of law, fighting corruption and improving sustainability. But it's no small task. Prime Minister Denis Shevhel estimates the cost of rebuilding Ukraine at $750 billion. What binds all of us in this room together is the desire in this time of uh, horror, wanton destruction and grief to provide the people of Ukraine with the prospect of a return to a life of self-determination, peace and a bright future. That road is long, but it is never too early to prepare for the time when the weapons fall silent. Europe has a special responsibility and a strategic interest to be at Ukraine's side every step of the way. Ukraine wants to be part of our European Union, and we want Ukraine to become a member of the European Union. Ukraine is highly motivated to work with us in this direction. And we will do our utmost to support these efforts. Well, Russia needs to be held to account for this appalling war uh, that has been perpetrated in Ukraine. And we are looking at options for uh, the deployment of Russian assets. We've discussed it as, at the G7 and many of our allies are also looking at how we can make sure that Russia is contributing to Ukrainian recovery. Well, we'll begin our discussion in a moment. But first, Alan Fisher has this report from the Ukrainian city of Erbin. When the international community is told it will take somewhere in the region of $750 billion to rebuild Ukraine, it sounds like a lot of money because it is a lot of money. And a lot of that will be spent on big infrastructure programmes, like rebuilding bridges and roads, rebuilding the water system that have been destroyed in the first few months of the war but also boils down to something like this. A place where a woman called Natalia called home. She lived here with her three children and her husband and it was destroyed during the Russian advance. And as you can see, there's absolutely nothing left. Everything she has, has gone. And there are thousands of homes, tens of thousands of homes around this country that'll have to be rebuilt. Even today, we're seeing engineers and builders who are looking at buildings nearby that have been hit and affected by what's happened over the last couple of months to see what can be rebuilt or what will have to be pulled down. And all of that costs money. Now, we know that in the early days of the war, some six million people left the country. There are eight million internally displaced people, and many of them haven't seen their homes yet. They will come back to scenes like this, places that are absolutely, completely destroyed. And to rebuild them, the Ukrainian government knows it needs money. And to rebuild them, the Ukrainian government knows that that money has to come from international donors. But Natalia also wants the international community to know that when they give that money, they're helping her and her family get back into a home because at the moment, all they have is nothing. Alan Fisher for Inside Story. So let's bring in our guests for this edition of Inside Story. In Copenhagen, Olena Prokopenko, the co-chairwoman of the Transatlantic Task Force on Ukraine and a fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. In London, Timothy Ash, a senior emerging market sovereign strategist at Blue Bay Asset Management. And in Kristiansand, Norway, Hannah Schlest, a director of the Security Studies Programme at Ukrainian Prism, a foreign policy and security think tank. A warm welcome to all of my guests. Elena, can I just begin with you? I mean, the war's not over. 
Uh, this conference is on talking about reconstruction. Even only last week at the NATO conference uh, in Madrid, uh, Ukraine, Ukraine and its president were asking for more munitions. Uh, the war is ongoing. Is this a subject that's far too early to be discussed and far too early to be having a meeting about? Uh, well, given the immensity of the reconstruction needs and the construction efforts that Ukraine will have to engage in, one cannot start too early. Uh, it is critical that uh, by the time when it will be possible to start the actual reconstruction, uh, all the necessary financial and political mechanisms uh, are in place. Uh, moreover, the recovery will, um, of course, require massive financial resources. Therefore, it is already import important and crucial to start confiscating Russian uh, assets uh, in the West so that they are readily available by the time when the circumstances um, allow for their construction to start. And, and, and finally, uh, this immense effort will require uh, outstanding coordination, um, uh, coordination of uh, uh, a very complex pool of uh, actors in mm. Ukraine and abroad. Therefore, this conference was um, an important opportunity to set up those coordination mechanisms and to establish the platforms that will allow for uh, the coordination to start. And the approaches to uh, this recovery have been uh, agreed upon, so I think it was a successful effort. And of course, we're going to delve into those issues uh, within the next half hour. Hannah, would you agree with all of that? Yes, but also you need to understand that when we are talking about so-called Marshall Plan for Ukraine, we are talking not only about the physical reconstruction of all those objects that have been uh, um, destroyed in the territory of Ukraine. First of all, uh, uh, Ukraine being asking for the restoration of schools, hospitals. That's something which you need already at the liberated territories. But also all those monies that Ukraine requested, part of them are going for the reforms, reforms needed for the European integration of the country. And Ukraine just received the status of the candidate. Mm -hmm. Some of them are needed for the energy independence of the country. That's also the question that we already can resolve, not waiting for the uh, end of the war. Some of them are for the digitalization. Ukraine already been on the path uh, in this direction and considering how now in these war conditions, a lot of the processes being impossible to implement in the uh, offline. So digital pass for the state services, for example, mm -hmm. is quite an important way. Uh, so okay. what we are called reconstruction, it's not only the reconstruction plan. It's more of the recovery and the modernization and development plan. Exactly what the Marshall Plan been uh, 70 years ago. Of course. Uh, Tim, can I just bring you in here? Because obviously this meeting that uh, is, is happening in Switzerland has slightly morphed from what would have been really an EU meeting to discuss how Ukraine needs to improve to become an EU member into what is now a, a larger conversation about EU, uh, Ukraine's recovery uh, after a war. Planning these sorts of things are one thing. Setting about how you get the money together and who does what is an immense task. And with that comes a very large price tag. When you heard about this, what was your initial reaction about trying to rebuild while there's a war still going on? Well, the, the two phases to this, right? The, the first one is funding Ukraine's conduct of the war and make sure it's successful. And numbers came out this week about that, 65 billion to year end and then when the presumably the, there is going to be a peace and um, you know we the, there will need to be a reconstruction and i think the west will will want to make sure that ukraine is successful so then we're into sort of the reconstruction numbers that have been mentioned i mean 700 billion it's finger in the air stuff really um, i mean kind of what we know is there's been a, a big real gdp decline in ukraine probably 30 40 percent and dollar exchange rate move if you think about dollar gdp it was about 200 billion before the war, it's probably going to be about 100 billion. After that's 100 billion loss, and then there's the infrastructure hits, has already been mentioned. Huge uh, impacts on airports, on roads, on schools, hospitals, you name it. You know, it's very hard uh, to put a figure on that. I mean, the Ukrainians have been quite systematic. They've gone through the list of of big infrastructure that they've lost, and they're also thinking about housing, residential, etc. And they come to this figure, 700 billion. You know. Uh, it, it could be anywhere from 300 mm. to 700, but it's a very, very big number and someone's got to pay for it. And as has already been mentioned, there is already a big pot of money that is very accessible. That's $300 billion of frozen uh, Central Bank of Russia reserves. It's in the Fed. It's in the Bank of England, the ECB. We have access to it. I think it should be confiscated and used uh, for re Ukraine, re Ukraine reconstruction. It's, it's ridiculous to think 
that you know Western taxpayers have got to pay this 700 billion when the country that's been doing the damage, Russia, it's clear cut, Russian missiles, Russian attacks on Ukraine, it is responsible for war crimes and the loss of huge amount of infrastructure. It should pay, the money's there. We need to make sure we make the legal changes required, if there are any changes needed, to make sure these Russian assets are deployed to Ukraine to fund that reconstruction. And to let me just quickly come in there, because that's a part of the next question, is, is there a legal way to fund this uh, when you talk about the oligarchs and confiscating their money without them coming back uh, to, you might say, the courts in the future and saying what was done to us was unfair and illegal. Have you ever had any experience or through your contacts of this that sort of scenario that, that this, could, this could happen, it is a possibility, or are we actually venturing into uh, new areas of the sort of legal realm of confiscating individuals' assets and using them to rebuild the country? Well, there is a precedent, which was the, the first Gulf War, when Iraq was made to pay reparations to Kuwait. So on the sovereign side, I think it should be fairly clear cut. Uh, you know, the 300 billion in assets I mentioned was the Central Bank of Russia. I mean, that's essentially the Russian state. I think we'd all accept that the Russian state is responsible for this war, so it should be made to pay. And then there's the oligarch money. I mean, again, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm not quite sure exactly how much it has, has been frozen, mm. but we're talking about tens of billions of dollars. And then I think it's a case by case basis. And I think it's up to the, the Western legal authorities to make sure they build a good cast iron case. But remember, you know, many of these oligarchs are extensions of the Russian state. Uh, their, uh, their enterprises very often act on Russian state interests. Okay. So again, but the West will have to prove that. The G7 communique from last week uh, spelled it out. I mean, essentially said, we want to explore ways to do this. It's up to the individual. Uh, it's a case by case basis. Okay. It depends on the individual Western countries and their own legal systems, yeah. how we do it. Okay, uh, Hannah, uh, you, you want to come in there? Yes, I absolutely agree uh, regarding the state money, but about the oligarchs, you need to uh, um, think a little bit more creative. Uh, first of all, uh, most of those whose frozen assets we have as for now, they are under the sanctions. And in the sanctions mechanism, it's written very clearly why they are there, not just because they are rich, but because they had a very direct connection to the Kremlin, they are supporting their policies. Okay. But uh, from another side, we uh, can make the parallels with the latest UK legislation, for example, when you need to prove what is the, uh, um, from where is your assets, yeah, when you're buying, for example, uh, property in London. And that's been done exactly because a lot of the Russian oligarchs and the state servants being just laundering money in uh, uh, London and in general in the United Kingdom. So here it is the same. If these oligarchs will be able to prove from where is this money, if this money are legal or not. And uh, as we know from many of the investigations about the offshores and about the uh, activities of these oligarchs, most of this money, they will not be able to prove uh, what is the real source of that. OK, well, let me come to Elena then, because obviously if you have this big pot of money available and there's very... Uh, uh, there's options of uh, oligarch money that's been confiscated. There's also the talk of going to financial institutions, of which we have Tim here, obviously, uh, as an expert to talk to us about it. But much is being said, Elena, about the Marshall Plan. Obviously, for our, some viewers who might not know what that is, it was a plan uh, created by the Americans in Europe after uh, post-World War II to rebuild uh, Europe and to make sure that trade and communities could thrive after what was a, a terrible global conflict. Much has been said about the Marshall Plan and, and implications of that in this particular case. Do you see similarities that can be used? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that during this uh, Ukraine recovery conference uh, taking place in Lugano, uh, there have been uh, a number of uh, uh, bilateral commitments made in terms of reconstruction of Ukraine. The EU announced uh, that it would establish a platform uh, for Ukraine recovery and will allocate 100 billion euros for the recovery effort. Uh, there were also a number of commitments from uh, bilateral uh, partners to take over the uh, reconstruction of specific Ukrainian cities and regions. But uh, I got the impression that the Marshall Plan per se in its full uh, in its uh, full fledged um, uh, version is not uh, perceived by um, Ukraine's key international partners as something that's um, timely right now. It seems like uh, these individual efforts and uh, setting up of the 
a general uh, reconstruction platform will uh, be the focus and the the, the uh, priority for the next uh, uh, few months, whereas the uh, full-fledged uh, Marshall Plan uh, is uh, something that international partners seem to be um, uh, putting um, on hold right now. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't get the impression that this is something that's already discussed in depth uh, in the framework of this conference. Uh, Tim, th let me bring you in here, because obviously a lot of money and figures is being banded around at the moment, certainly by those that are at this conference in Switzerland, and yet their respective uh, populations are watching what's going on back home. Where you're in London, uh, Elena is in Copenhagen, and, and Hannah is in Norway. And these countries are all offering money to Ukraine at a time, and I'm sure you can tell us about the markets, where the public is worrying about how much food they can put on the table, how um, fuel prices are increasing. And they're seeing their government offering another nation billions and billions uh, of dollars. How is that sitting uh, it, it, within the markets about the way pe people feel uh, and the way you're seeing investments? Well, you know, I think populations in West European countries, well, Western countries, I think, are understanding of Ukraine's plight. I think people get it that uh, this is a challenge to our system of governments, our, you know, the way we work, the way we live. Putin is a threat. There's a cost and a price to pay. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it's been paid through high inflation. It's very painful. Our governments need to work hard, harder, to uh, target support for poorer sections of, of, of our populations. But in the end, you know, we have to think, how are we going to pay this? And again, going back, why should Western taxpayers pay when there is hundreds of billions of dollars of Russian money sitting there in, in the West that we can use for the reconstruction? So in reality, there's no reason why Western taxpayers should have to pay for this. You know, Russia should have to pay for the damage it's, uh, it's been carried out in Ukraine. I would add, you mentioned the markets. I mean, one thing that, you know, the market can uh, partner up with the official sector, with the taxpayer, Western taxpayer and the Russian central bank assets, et cetera. Um, you know, uh, big banks, uh, international financial markets, I think will be willing to buy into this Ukraine recovery once there's peace. But official lenders need to think carefully about, you know, how at the moment Ukraine support is working. At the moment, uh, Ukraine's four to five billion uh, monthly deficit is being funded by some uh, Western governments, but a lot of it has been funded by debt. At the end of the year, Ukraine could end up with a 100% debt GDP ratio. It could end up with a default debt restructuring, which would actually make the market access very difficult once the war ends. You could have a complicated debt restructuring and then market access will be limited for two years. The private sector will be less willing to lend. So I think those governments that are providing funding to Ukraine at the moment needs to change the orientation away from debt to credit, to, to sorry, grant aid. That's an interesting uh, way of looking at it, because Hannah, obviously, uh, it's been made very clear by everybody that's attending uh, in Switzerland that this is not a pledging conference. It's a way of looking forward and how much all of this would, would cost. And I can see uh, uh, Elena also agreeing to that. But we've seen historically, uh, Hannah, pledging conferences in the before Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, Somalia, Palestine and Iraq. In some cases, they benefited on a very small level to these sorts of um, pledging conferences uh, and the money never actually turned up. Do you think this is going to be different? Uh, this is going to be different, first of all, because that is not just a pledging conference, but that is the annual conference about the uh, uh, reconstruction of Ukraine and the reforms in Ukraine. And the original name of this event uh, before the war, because it's been planned several months as you go, is exactly the uh, uh, Ukraine Reform Conference. We had it already in London, in uh, Copenhagen, in uh, uh, Vilnius. So there will be that is the fourth or the fifth already. And uh, those who've been coming there, they talked a lot also about reforms in Ukraine what Ukraine can do. So that is not just the uh, conference of donors and those that you named about the Syria, Iraq or Yemen, they were predominantly donors conference when they were coming, looking what they have in their pockets and how they can sponsor the certain reconstruction in the country. Mm. The idea behind this conference in Lugano being much wider because uh, as partners, Ukraine and our uh, uh, partners around the world wanted to discuss what should be the future of Ukraine, what type of Ukraine we would like to build. 
field. So it's not just money that we are giving to reconstruct the school, but also how to make Ukraine more efficient in times of war, how to help our financial system, uh, what to do with our energy system. So when we are coming to the end of the war, uh, we are not starting from the scratch, but we also already have a certain plan uh, what the future of Ukraine should be. But many of the things what Ukraine should be, it should be done already, not wasting time when the war is over. And of course, that's an overview, of course. Uh, uh, Alana, can I just bring you in here? Because it's estimated that 45 million square metres of housing has been destroyed, 256 enterprises, 656 medical institutions and 1,177 educational institutions have been damaged, destroyed or seized. Obviously, the job has to start from the bottom upwards and you have to start on a small um, level to get the community involved at the ground level. I mean, how do you see recovery? It's easy to sort of say so much money is required for all of this, but somebody has to actually do it and they have to organise it. Where, how do you see the process moving on? Uh, well, I'd like to, to come back on, on what uh, Hannah previously said about this um, this conference being not just about recovery, but also about reforms. And and uh, it's uh, there's a number of very concrete steps that the Ukrainian government can already uh, move forward with without waiting for the war to be uh, won. Uh, and, I, uh, and I believe that these steps will be critical for the um, success of the reconstruction effort eventually. And I primarily mean, uh, of course, anti-corruption efforts, and uh, a number of conditionalities that Ukraine um, committed to comply with when it was given the uh, EU Canada status recently. Uh, it is critical to um, to uh, ensure the uh, appointment of uh, the leadership of anti-corruption institutions. And while Ukraine has one of the most advanced anti-corruption infrastructures in the world, it is important to make it fully functional. And there are a number of other steps that are uh, important to to uh, conduct and to uh, to make right now as to the process going forward i think that while the uh, um, partnerships and um, assistance packages that have been announced at this conference are uh, are quite impressive and and ukraine very much appreciates that um, i believe more assistance packages and commitments will follow as soon as uh, the ukrainian government releases uh, the finalized plan of the recovery because as of now and the conference only uh, a summary of the plan and priorities of the plan have been uh, announced. So okay. I believe um, it is important to see the uh, just okay. to see the detailed plan in each uh, specific area for the international community to be able to commit. So okay. yes, it is not a pledging conference be because the war is still ongoing and because the uh, recovery plan is still a living yeah. document. And and it is really uh, critical to engage. Um, uh, local communities to engage mayors, to engage uh, regional uh, leadership, because this is what uh, the uh, decentralization reform was uh, was for. This sure. is this is why uh, this is why uh, the last uh, uh, eight years have been um, have been committed, uh, among other reforms, to making sure that communities have a say and have a seat at the table in. Um, the efforts to reform the country, including now on the recovery asset. So I, um, uh, I, I can see some concerns with regard to um, making this recovery process inclusive enough. And let me, uh, I've heard from... Uh, let me yeah. just jump in there, because Hannah's agreeing, but I want to just come back to Timothy, because obviously, Tim, you know, the financial institutions are listening to the noises coming out of Lugano at the moment. Are these, are sorts of, are these the sorts of conversations, words that they want to hear about, you know, c dealing with corruption, getting the community involved in at the grassroots level? Because even Marcus Bent, who's head of the uh, European International Bank, is saying that, you know, you have to start at a macro level, you have to start at ground level start rebuilding and you also have to make sure the bombs stop well absolutely i mean you need peace you need macro stability uh issues like fighting corruption were there before the war they're going to be there after the war but what i would highlight i mean this idea you can get an impression that somehow the west needs to intervene and you know run ukraine after after the war i mean actually Ukrainians have done an incredible job in stopping an enormous Russian military machine. I mean, they've shown ingenuity and innovation. You know, the, the electricity works, the railways work, uh, institutions work. I mean, that's utterly remarkable. So I think once the war stops, 
uh, new Ukraine and, and, and not the old Ukraine, which was probably oligarchs, I think is a real opportunity again to flourish and build on what was achieved uh, during this, this conflict, which is, you know, uniting the country, focusing the country on, on delivering a victory. Uh, and I think, you know, it's, it's almost like a state of Israel moment for Ukraine, right? I mean, it's kind of, you know, they, they've rallied around, they've, they've worked together and, and achieved some remarkable things. And I think actually um, the reconstruction and recovery could be a huge success, okay. you know, with this, with this focus, with the ambition, with Western support, with financing, hopefully, from those frozen uh, Russian assets and with the innovation and ingenuity that this, you know, 40 million people, big country, important country in Europe, uh, can deliver. And I think the okay. private sector will be very interested to get involved in that. Well, we'll see what happens. Unfortunately, we have to leave it there. It's been a, a very interesting chat. I'm sure we'll uh, come back to it again in the future. I'd like to thank my guests, uh, Alana Prokopenko in Copenhagen, Timothy Ash in London, and Hannah Schillat in Kristiansand in Norway. And thank you for watching this edition of Inside Story. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sahil Rahman, and the Inside Story team here in Doha. Thanks for your time and your company.